Cannon from UVM for joining us tonight to talk about, about a very timely uh, topic, which is China. China yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, Professor Buchanan was born in London. He has a BA in modern history from uh, Oxford, right? Correct. And uh, then he got his PhD and MA from Rutgers University. He talks, uh, he teaches now at UVM where he's a senior lecturer. I've taken now uh, three of his classes and I must say they're the most, um, they're almost transformative. I don't know if I told you that, Professor Buchanan. Hey. And that is because he has a perspective that is very unusual, which is a global perspective. For instance, right now I'm taking his class in global history since 1500, which is largely I think, although I it hasn't finished the course, it seems to be the development of the modern world and how the modern world developed uh, through uh, really the development of the transatlantic slave trade, the development of the new world, and then the transformation of China and other parts of the world. Uh, that is what I believe that this professor always does. He puts history in a global context that's very unusual and very interesting to me. And that's what um, I hope we hear about tonight. So here he is, Professor Buchanan, and he's living in the Adirondacks. Which... Okay, so good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to your to, to give this lecture tonight. Um, I'm going to try and um, right now just share my screen. Oh, yeah, you're at, uh, whoever's the actual, I think, Beth, you're going to have to, it says you've you are actually going to have to enable the screen, sh get, give me the screen sharing in order to, to share my screen. Did that work? No. Let's have a look. Oh yeah, there we go. I'm a, that's it. That's good. Okay. Great. Okay, so I hope you can all kind of see that. Um, okay, so um, well, I was really excited to be invited to give this talk tonight by by, by Sandy. Um, and I, I'm probably going to talk for about 45, 40, 45 minutes, and then hopefully there'll be some time for questions and, and discussion afterwards. I, I'm going to start with a little bit of a disclaimer, which which is that I'm not I'm not actually an expert on the history of China. I'm I'm I am I, I'm a global historian, and what I what I hope to be able to present tonight is sort of thinking through a little bit about the place of China in in in, in world history and. Uh, more yesterday and today than tomorrow, or probably more yesterday and then a little bit of today and then tomorrow we can discuss in the in the, in the question in the question and answers. But I assume this is a topic on your on all of your minds for fairly obvious reasons. So anyway, let's get let's get straight to, straight into it. Um, as Sandy as Sandy uh, said in her in her in her introduction, there the the global history course that I teach. Um, and this is sort of in common with a lot of with, with, with a lot of global history courses around around the country, kind of breaks in 1500. So there's a part one of everything up to 1500, then a part two from 1500 onwards. And 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 in terms of thinking about the emergence of the modern world, that that makes some some sense in terms in, in some ways. But it really doesn't make much sense in terms of Chinese history. And in 1500, it was kind of right bang in the middle of the Ming, of the Ming Dynasty, um, and and this map here, I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk to you about the details, but um, you get a sense of the scale of China in the Ming Dynasty, pretty much pretty pre, pretty close to its geographical current geographical area, uh, large uh, centralized uh, state. Single, single unified government ruling the whole, the whole vast territory. Common, pretty much a common language, common legal system, common, common, co common currency. Uh, powerful army uh, deployed mostly on the border, defensive, defensively. Um, all of this resting, all of this sort of superstructure of, the, of, of state administration resting on, on millions and, and, and millions of heavily taxed peasant farmers, highly productive peasant farmers, particularly of course in the south in the in the wet wet rice regions of southern of southern of southern China. Um, population of about 125 million uh, in around 1500, a little bit over a quarter of the entire entire uh, estimated world population living in living under one government. <laughs> pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. 
Uh, you had, I, I, I don't know why we always say this thing about Martians, but anyway, I'll say it. If you had been a Martian and you'd landed on Earth in 1500 and you'd scooted around, sort of um, looking at these various various different states and, 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 their, and their organization and stuff, you, you would have, I think, by any objective measure, come to the conclusion that China was, was, was far and away not only the largest, but the most centralized, in many ways, the most modern looking state on the face of the on the face of the on the face of the globe it, it was it, in many ways it was typical of other large agricultural based states the Mughal Empire the Safavid Empire I'm, I'm just talking about contemporaries in 1500 the Ottoman Empire the Malian Empire in West Africa even the Aztec and in Inca em empires in in the Americas all of which have have some very common similar common sort of structural structural features. But China, clearly the largest, the most powerful, the most centralized. I started in 1500 just because that's where the, my course starts. But, but what I've just described to you really would have been true. I'm going to say more or less true at any time since about after about 200 BCE onwards. Um, the, the, until the, until the, the, the late 1700s, that China was clearly the, the single largest, most unified, powerful, centralized, economically, militarily, et cetera, state on the face of the earth. I, I say more or less at any time, because while that's true for long periods of history, there were particular moments when it wasn't true. This is a, this is a this is a graph of of, 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 of China's population, and, and you can see it has this interesting kind of wave function kind of going on here. Um, so here's Han China that I just beginning back 200 BCE. You can see that you can see the increasing population. You can see this peaking, declining. This that's actually called on the chart here the era of disunity. And then you start to see the recovery, the Tang Dynasty, the Song Dynasty, and then in the 1200s, the Mongol invasion, the, 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 another sort of uh, de decline. And then uh, the dynasty I've just been talking about, the Ming, so here's 1500, top maxes out about 1600, and then a period of, 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 de of decline, short, short, relatively short, and then, and then the population rises again in the in the in 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 the Qing Dynasty, I, I'm 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 using I'm using I'm using population here as a sort of stand-in for general economic and political health. It doesn't map necessarily directly, but it's but it's pretty close. These these the, the, these waves mark periods of of consolidation of a new dynasty, uh, economic expansion, economic growth, military expansion. Okay. And then, and and then, what we might refer to as imperial overstretch, uh, biting off more than you can chew, trying to organize more than you can really organize. Increasingly, rebellion in the provinces, military rebellion in the provinces, has often accompanied by by peasant revolts against against the heavy taxation, and sometimes accompanied by 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 by, by invasion. From the from, from the from the steppes, from the steppe nomadic nomadic peoples, and the dynasties overthrown, you go into a period of collapse, of disintegration, and then after some time, a new dynasty arises. So this is I I, I don't you know this can, you can oversimplify stuff, and but this is a this is this is genuinely a pattern of of of, of Chinese history. Um, it's actually truly also a pattern of history in, in all of the major um, large uh, agricultural based states. You could draw a similar chart for, for India. You could look at similarly for Persia, um, you know, in other, in, 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 other, in other regions. This is, this is a pattern. It's particularly a marked pattern and, 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 a, and, a, and an easily traceable pattern in Chinese, in Chinese history. So... I want to contrast what I've just described with Western Europe. Mm, yeah. This is this is this is. I don't know if you can. Can you? I hope you can see. Yeah. These. This is this is this is this is Eurasia. Uh, in in a, in 
year one one seven in the common era, which is which is often given as the as as the the, the year of maximum expansion of the Roman Empire. It's after Trajan co completes the co conquest of Dacia. Anyway, the, my point is here: you can see that you see these two you see these two giant empires at opposite ends of Eurasia. Here's Han Dynasty China, uh, pretty much the same territory as the as the Ming we were looking at. You know. 13, 1400 years later. Um, and here's Rome uh, spread out around the Mediterranean world, more or less equal population, somewhere 50 plus million in each of them at the time. They're sometimes referred to as, 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 as barbells, two massive weights at opposite ends of at opposite ends of, of, of Eurasia. So if you'd arrived, if your Martian had arrived on Earth in 117 CE, you might have drawn the conclusion that. These two massive centralized empires, agricultural based, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, of course, you, you all know what happens. The, the, the Roman Empire collapses in the 400s. Similar reasons for the for the collapse of the of the of the Chinese dynastic empires, imperial overstretch, revolt of revolt of, of generals on the frontiers, peasant rebellion, slave rebellion in the Roman Empire barbarian quote unquote invasions germans huns etc 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 um but that's where the similarity ends um rather than there being a period of of collapse and disintegration and then a new roman empire arises and everything gets pulled back together i.e the, the chinese pattern um that's not what happens in western europe uh, Western Europe remains uh, politically politically fragmented. There are a couple of attempts to, to, those of you who know your European history will know there's a couple of attempts to sort of create a unified Europe. I'm thinking particularly of Charlemagne in the, yeah. in, the uh, in the 800s or Charles V in the, in, in the early 1500s to actually create a centralized European state, but none of it lasts very long. Charlemagne's empire collapses within a within a within a generation, um, and 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 the Habsburgs don't don't make it for very much, don't make it for very much longer. So here's an interesting pattern to sort of start us thinking about, to start us to start to start us thinking about these, the, these the the, the 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 sort of the patterns of global history in the place of China, and the place of China in it. So here's Europe in the 1500s. This is at the same time as those images of Ming, of, of Ming Dynasty China I was showing you. By the, by the time you get to the 1500s, you have got three larger kingdoms starting to emerge, Spain, France, England, um, but Germany, Italy, um, still a, a complete, a complete uh, 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 sort of kaleidoscope of small little states and principalities and city states and all kinds of and, and all kinds of other stuff and even the unity of Spain is pretty is only just is, is still pretty is still pretty tenuous you've still got Burgundy as a separate state uh, other, other little other little uh, feudal princedoms in in the, in the middle of France and, and, and stuff so mm -hmm. It, it, it's not that it's not that Europe was economically unproductive. You've got very highly productive peasant classes in 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 Europe. You've got about eighty million of them, so not that much less than the Chinese population. Um, but politically, uh, you have this that you have this entirely different you have this entirely different picture. Well, this lays the basis for what I'm going to refer to as the advantages of backwardness. Um, and here it is: the absence of a uh, the absence of a strong centralized state in Western Europe is, really is going to uh, is going to is going to open the door to forms of economic activity which the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty China uh, consciously exclude, and that's to say, of mercantile capitalism. The Chinese government. All the Chinese governments, really, to 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 one degree or another, um, uh, sort of guided by Confucian Confucian ideas. These ideas privilege hierarchy, stability, social order. Those kind of those kind of things, both within the family and within society as a as as, as a whole. 
they are they are not favorable to to, to to innovation they're not favorable to the personal accumulation of wealth the greatest sort of um, the greatest uh, goal of a, 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 a of a elite Chinese person is not to enrich themselves as a merchant but is to is to have an honorable career as a, as a, as a civil civil servant I mean they're gonna they're gonna have nice com they're gonna have comfortable lives don't get me wrong but that but that that that, that drive of Personal enrichment is is, is is not really is, is not really this expressed in the same way. The absence of the absence of a strong centralized state yeah. in, in in Western Europe, on the on the other hand, creates many more opportunities for merc for, for the emergence of merc merc mercantile yeah. mercantile classes um, and the beginnings, first of all, in the in the in the realm of trade, and then, of course, later on, in the realm of, of production itself, the, the emergence of the emergence of capitalism. So, by the so, so by 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 exactly at the same time as all this is taking place, late 1400s, early 1500s, here's the here's the emergence of the Spanish Empire. This is a very different pattern of empire than, than, than China. This is geographically very diffuse. You can see this is when they're fused. This is for the period when they're fused with, with, with Portugal. You can see most of it is small. These, these little blue dots kind of scattered all around the West Coast, the East Coast of Africa, into the, the, uh, into the, into the, uh, into the Atlantic, uh, the uh, Brazil, the sugar plantations of Brazil, um, into the spice island, so-called spice islands of, in, 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 of Indonesia, the Philippines. These, this is this is a new type of this is a new type of this is an empire of global of global trade of capital of capital capitalist trade on a world on 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 a, on a world scale and of course it gets a gigantic it gets a gigantic boost the discovery of the Americas quote unquote by Europeans the the colonization of the Americas the the, the Atlant some of the things Sandy was talking about in her introduction the, 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 the Atlantic, the Atlantic slave trade, the enormous profitability of the uh, uh, of slave produced sugar in the West Indies, all of this, all of this contributes to 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 to, to, to the to the transition in Western Europe uh, from mercantile capitalism towards industrial cap towards industrialization, and of course by the end of the by by, by the middle of the 1700s. Certainly, by the 1760s and 1770s, you have the development of industrial production beginning in England, in in in, in, Engl in England, uh, or in Britain, uh, connected to connected to the to the world, uh, connected to the trade to India, for example. I mean, it's arguable the first the first massive the first industrialization of cotton production, cotton textile production in in in, in Britain. Is 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 to outproduce the Indian Indian uh, cotton industry, which is basically destroyed by British imports in the mm -hmm. next couple of in the next fifty or sixty sixty years. So when you think about these patterns, what we what we're now seeing is a rather than this sort of general cyclical pattern, give or take the period periodicity. I'm not trying to make some some. But 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 now we have a completely new pattern emerging in Western in, for, for, from Western Europe and from from Britain from Britain in in, in particular. Oh, yeah. it, it's the, it's a consequence of the backwardness <laughs> compared to China. Um, it's a but but now it's going to in in and in a very short period of time, I'm talking about less than a hundred years. It, it's it's going to completely transform. Global uh, power, pa power, power relationships. Um, first of all, as I said, by in, in, in India, this is going to open the way, of course, to the British colonization, colonization of, 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 of India. Um, but also a little bit later, really beginning in the in the middle of the 1800s, of of, of, of the uh, of the tremendous pressure of cap of capitalist trade. Uh, on, uh, on 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 China. Up until this point, the Chinese had been pretty successful in in, in restricting uh, the uh, trade with the West. They wanted some trade with the West. They 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 particularly wanted silver, um, which uh, a lot of it came uh, via uh, via the silver mines of of, of of Central America, of course. 
Um, but they didn't really, it wasn't really important to China. The Chinese considered they had everything they needed domestically. They didn't really, there was nothing they really needed from, from, from the Europeans. It was fine to sell them some porcelain and some silk and stuff like that and to, in exchange for, exchange for silver. So long as we could, so long as the Chinese could keep them restricted to one uh, city, Guangzhou or, or, or Canton, uh, they could only come. They could only um, come into China, into 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 Guangzhou at, uh, for a certain limited number of months of the year. They couldn't travel. The English, the European merchants, this is. They couldn't travel into the interior of China. They couldn't learn Chinese. They couldn't develop their own relationships with local Chinese business people. It was going to be strictly controlled. Well, now of course the English, emerging as the leading power in this process in 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 Europe. Um, a, a sort of viewing this gigantic potential market in China, um, they they, uh, they 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 run up against, they chafe against the restrictions placed on the tr on the on on trade by the Chinese government, and finally they came up with a brilliant solution, brilliant by their lights, I guess, which is is basically to 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 to, to sell opium to the Chinese. To force the force the consumption of opium, they start growing enormous, producing enormous quantities of opium in 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 in, in India, and and shipping it into China. Obviously, the Chinese government tries to restrict, tries to control this trade, um, and the British reply, as I'm sure you all know, by launching two uh, opium, so-called opium wars against China in the middle of, one in the 1840s, the second one in the or at, at late 1830s, 18, early 1840s, the second one in the 1850s. The US, the Americans join in the second one, by the way, which actually burns uh, a big, burns a big, big chunk of Beijing to the ground um, and, 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 and uh, sacks the summer palace of the emperor and, 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 and so on. Um, so, so, so this is this this war is waged by the English in the, under the banner of free trade, uh, the great the great principle of of, of free of, of, of free trade. And you can see I I, I like this for this this image because it's sort of um, here you've got the, the you know the modern uh, steam powered uh, paddle uh, steamer gunboat uh, of the British of the British. Now actually it's actually it's an East India Company ship, but. So there's a com direct commercial thing going on here, and here it is bl blasting the blasting the, the sailing junks of the Chinese navy, um, uh, uh, in destroying the destroy destroying the Chinese navy. Um, so uh, from backward from backward Europe, we've now got to it's we've sort of had this flip advanced now advanced Europe imposing it imposing its imposing itself on China, and of course what's going to what 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 what's going to follow from this? Um, you all know about the trap, the scramble for Africa, the scramble for European colonies in in, in sub-Saharan Africa. There's really going to be, in many ways, a parallel scramble for China, which is really a scramble to to get into and break up the 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 the, the Ch 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 Qing Dynasty in China. Um, so you can you get a little sense of it on this map here. Something happened. Um, the you are you good? The, yeah, um, okay. yeah. the, uh, the, the green areas here showing the, uh, showing the uh, British influence. So Hong Kong, of course, annexed by the British, the, the, the uh, British trade up the, in, in the Yangtze, uh, the, the Chinese, uh, sorry, the French uh, colonizing Indo, in Indochina and ex expanding their influence into southern, into southern China. The, the, the Japanese annexing Korea becomes a Korean colony in 1910. Uh, Taiwan, Japanese uh, annexing Taiwan, uh, German co German colonies. I mean, really, you get all the, you get all the major imperial powers trying to trying to get a, try, trying to get into China, trying to trying to open China to 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 to, to their trade. Um, the 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 breakup of the I mean, the Qing Dynasty survives kind of, but 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 under under this tremendous tremendous pressure, um, you start getting exactly some of these other phenomena, major peasant. Major peasant revolts, the the Taiping revolt in the middle of the century, um, had the box the box of rebellion at the end, which the which the imperial powers kind of join forces to help to help crush. Uh, you got to stay up here. So 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 you, you, you sort of open season on China. Uh, 
militarily prostrate before the before the the the, the well equipped modern armies of of the Europeans of the Japanese and the and and of course the the the, the, Amer the Americans. Um, this is all sort of temporarily, and to some degree, this is pushed back by the Chinese, by the by the Great Chinese Revolution in 19, 1911, 1912. This is a this is a sort of democratic revolution. This is a this is the overthrow of the Qing Dynasty and a, and a, and, a, and a sort of attempt to establish a a demo, modern democratic nation state, um, led by Sun Yat Sen. Um, but this is being done. I mean. This has been done under the gun of, of these foreign imperial interventions. So it's never, you, you never really get a sort of modern unified capital, Chinese capitalist nation state emerging in this period. You, you, although, the, although the Chinese revolution sort of pushes, pushes back some of these, some of these projects, uh, it doesn't, it, it's, it, it can't, it's, it, it can't, it can't defeat them. Um, so you're going to see this pattern continuing into the 20th century of, of, the, of the various foreign powers, various imperial powers kind of maneuvering to, 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 to gain influence in, in, in China. So here's China in the, here's, here's what, here, here's, a, here's a, this is, these are, by the way, these maps I'm going to show now, are, 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 you could, they're all free online in the Omni Atlas, so it's absolutely wonderful collection of online of online maps and so here you can see so here's 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 china in in 19 in 1932 we've already got the japanese invasion of manchuria it's going on up here and it begins in 1931 here's nationalist china you can see it's a pretty small little it's a this is the chiang kai-shek uh guomindang government in, in nationalist china and and you can see all of these others these are all they're often referred to as warlords in Western histories. These are all the, the, these are basically local, little local mini governments, all heavily armed. Some of them are backed by the Germans. Some of them are backed by the Brit. I mean, they're all they're all backed by various of the imperial powers, and and nationalist China is, of course, under tremendous tremendous pre 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 pressure from 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 all of the, from all of this. Um, in a way, it's a wonderful. Uh, um, if you think back to that map of, of, of Western Europe in the 1500s with the political fragmentation, we've sort of got, a, this is now sort of imposed on, 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 on China. I, I'm, I'm obviously simplifying a great deal of history here. Too bad, we don't have time to go into it in great detail and you can ask me, we, we, I'm happy to go back and talk about any of this stuff in a little bit, in a little bit more detail. By the time we get to World War II, so it's 1931, we're going into the depression here. We're heading into what we're heading into World War II. That 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 great scramble for China I was just talking about has kind of resolved itself into an in, 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 into a, a sort of a, a sort of two part two, a, 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 a two part sort of struggle. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the United States. Which had, which had long viewed China as a, a, I mean, going back to the 1890s, and many, many American business and political elites had sort of viewed China as being the great future market for, for, for American business. Uh, and of course, the, the second major competitor, the, the rise of the Japanese, um, the rise of the Japanese empire, um, also, of course, uh, with a view to, uh, to, to a significant degree, associating its future prosperity, wealth, etc., with, with, with China. So, in a certain sense, that that the Germans, the Germans, the English, all those others, kind of the French, um, sort of fallen by the wayside to some degree. We can talk about the reasons for that. Maybe by the time you get to nineteen, the early nineteen forties, that that it's really resolved itself into the into this bipolar competition for, for, for control and influence in China, the Japanese on the one hand, who set up their own, they're often referred to as puppet governments. I think it's a little bit unfair because no one refers to the nationalist government as, of, as America's puppet government, but it really was, if you want to use that language. They, they all set up their local client regimes and back their local client, reg, local client, client regimes. And of course, World War II uh, follows the great, the great in 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 the Pacific, the great struggle between the United States and 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 and, and Japan, um, and so by 1945, 
that war is over. The Japanese are completely defeated, com I mean, utterly smashed um, by the United States. Japan's under American military, military occupation. It's a story you all know very well, the great, the great triumph of the United States at the end of World War II. Um, but, but there's, a, there's another side to that story, which is for various geopolitical and strategic reasons, um, the United States comes out of this war, which, which arguably in the Pacific was a war for predominance in China, right. certainly a central question in that war. Um, the United States comes out of that war with, with, in a very weak position in China. There's, there's, there's only about maybe 50, 60,000 American troops in China at the end of the war. Most of those are Air Force personnel or supply personnel and stuff. Um, Japan, J J there's still about 4 million Japanese tro occupation troops in China. And they're not, they are not defeated. Uh, unlike, of course, the Japanese troops in the Pacific and the Japanese Navy and so on and so forth. And as you see from this beautiful map, these 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 large red areas are kind of growing up here in the north of in the north of China. You've got in the course of this war, you've had a tremendous expansion in the Chinese in, in the influence of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, peasant lands land takeovers by the by, by the peasants, basically land re, land reform in the in, in in the midst of the in the midst of the war, and a much much stronger position for the for the, for the Chinese Communist Party. So, I, when I Teach when I, I write or teach on World War II, you, you've really got to. You, I, I believe you've really got to sort of think about when we think about the tremendous victory of the United States, the rise of American hegemony, all of those kind of questions, which are totally true, totally true. But they're not the whole story. Um, the, it, the, the US position, the, the anticipated US domin, dominance of China uh, at the end of World War II really doesn't, really doesn't happen. And, uh, when they try and send American troops into China in 19, late 1945 and into 1946, there's one of the most interesting yeah. and, and, un, 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 and often unremarked upon or unnoticed uh, factors in American military history, which is you have enormous um, rebellions by GIs who simply refuse to go. They 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 were recruit they they were conscripted to defeat Japan. Japan's been defeated. Time to go home. We're done. Um, it's uh, really profound. It's uh, huge demonstrations right in Manila, all across all across the Pacific. They even have they have big marches by GIs in Paris and stuff in solid in solidarity. And it, and it really stops the American government um, from being able to send to 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 to, to send major military forces into China at the end of the at the end of the war um, in it with that limitation which is a major limitation the united states is forced to try and negotiate a a a a, 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 a set up a coalition government in china uh, to broker a coalition government between the nationalists and the and the, and, and the communists the nationalists foolishly believe that they uh, that they have the upper hand They'll, the americans will back them if it comes to an open war um, and essentially they provoke a war with the with the with the communists um, the americans of course are not in a position to back them militarily there are no american troops sent to, sent to china to support the kuomintang um, by 19 by, by 1947 the civil war or chinese revolutionary war breaks out in full force and by 1949 the People's Republic of China is, is established, pro, 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 proclaimed by, 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 by Mao in Beijing in, in, in October 19, 1949. And over the next few, you can see, see at the time of this map, there's still some nationalist forces in, in the southern part of China here. But by, whoa, there we go. By October 1955, oh. just the date that happens to be on this map, by 1955, Lo and behold, we have a we have a Chinese state that's that that sort of looks in 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 its geographical extent something like Han China, Ming China. I mean, l like the old state of uh, all of that, all of those in all of those small little uh, uh, warlords have been have been have been crushed. All of it's unified into a single unified into a single unified uh, state. Um, 
The consequences, of course, in American domestic politics are, are, are huge. This is the hue and cry over who, lo who lost China. Um, this is not how it's supposed to, this was not how it was supposed to go down. I mean, this is four years after the end of World War II, after the end of the, the, the establishment of American uh, uh, global hegemony, you have, uh, you have China, which was in many ways the great, great prize of World War II is, is, is lost to the United States. It's, it's, it's really powerful. It's really, really powerful. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna try and talk about the internal developments in China over this period. I, I, I will just say this is, this is, this is profoundly contradictory in my opinion. On the one hand, you have a, gen a genuinely popular revolutionary, peasant-based, land reform-based, revolutionary type movement. You have a leadership which, is, which models itself very closely on, on Soviet Stalinism, including the cults of personality and all those other things. With all of with, with all we know we we know about how that how that functions and operates. So you kind of had these two things going on. Western histories tend, of course, to focus on the Stalinist aspects. Um, we we can read a lot about the the failures of the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution and those and and, and those kind of things and and and, and they were disasters. Um, but at the same time. I think there's a there, there's 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 a process of, of of rising living standards of healthcare of education amongst the, amongst the, amongst the peasantry in China, um, which is which is in marked contrast, let's say, to India. Um, if you just look at the sort of paths of India and China from from the end of the war until the 70s and 80s, you can you can see that I think very 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 quickly. But thinking about China in the world, I'm going to jump ahead to. The reintegration of China into the world market in in the in the early nineteen into the, in the early nineteen seventies, the reopening of China to the world by by conscious decision of the Chinese, the Chinese leadership, of course. The 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 goal here for Nixon, or one of the goals for Nixon, I mean, the immediate goal is to is to is to try and get leverage over the negotiations at the end of the Vietnam War. But the, but the bigger picture goal here is. Is, is, is we're now we're now this is now overlapping with a period in which the great the great upswing of American capitalist expansion coming out of World War II is now is now running out of is now running out of steam. Faith, U.S. business is facing increased competition from from from, from Germany, from Japan, from in, in particular from the European Union, um, and uh, U.S. business interests become increasingly enthusiastic about that, about offshoring production, finding new cheap labor platforms offshore. They start in, they start in Mexico, of course, um, but they also become very, very interested in, in, in China. The Chinese government is gonna co cooperate with this. Uh, they set up the special industrial uh, economic zones on the, coast, on the coast of China. They welcome foreign capital, the operation of foreign capital, but of course, the real, the real, the real plan here is to begin to develop Chinese Ch Ch Chinese domestic ch domestic capital as a result of this as a result of this uh, a a a a experience, um, and of, and 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 I I think you're all I, I'm sure well aware of some of, of what that starts to of what that starts to look like. I I, I don't know exactly what to do, what to call it. I've, I I I generally use the term state directed state directed capitalism you still have a significant state sector in china you still have the chinese government making up large scale um, planning decisions um, but of course you also have the you have also have the substantial operation of of, 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 of private capital in china um, but as you're all well aware this is this 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 has the capacity for enormous resource mobilization i i I, 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 I often have shown pictures here of the development of the China's high-speed rail network and stuff like of stuff like that, enormous infrastructure projects. Um, but I think that surely the one that's impressed us impressed us all the most over the last over the last year is the is the 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 the, 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 the response to the to the uh, to the coronavirus pandemic, the, the construction of, of, I mean, this is just one city, this is in Wuhan. I mean, literally two giant hospitals um, built from absolutely from scratch, 
in ten in ten days. I mean, these are stunning. These are these are stunning achievements of mobilization of resources, mobilization of mobilization of capital, and they and they, and they, and of course this 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 comes on the back of uh, of, of, of of a couple of at least decade and a half of very substantial year on year. I mean, we're talking 10, 12, 15%. I mean, very, very rapid, very, very rapid growth. This, of course, has been paralleled by a couple of major international projects, the, 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 the One Road, One Belt initiative, mm. which um, uh, is uh, promoting infrastructure, Chinese promoting, promoting infrastructural development uh, increasingly in sub-Saharan Africa, Wow. In in India, Pakistan, Iran, um, and, and 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 is and and is connected to projects in in Italy, in in Belgium, in 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 Russia, in other in in in, in all kinds in all kinds of other places. Um, enormous amounts of en enormous amounts of resources, enormous amounts of capital being invested in port port development, railroad construction, those kind of those the, 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 those those kind of things, and. On the right here, the, 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 a sort of new, it's almost like a parallel, it's almost like a parallel global economic infrastructure. Um, the, this is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the, 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 the member states in green and then other members. The, the, I mean, the ma only major state that's absent from this whole thing is the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it, it's very, it's very, it's very, very, it's very, very striking. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, we're going to see. Um, we're we're, we're going to see. Not surprisingly, this is going to be. This is going to be paralleled by a, a by a, by a substantial increase in Chinese military power. Um, this is the first Chinese aircraft carrier. It was bought. It was it was bought basically as a rusty hulk from the Ukrainians. Um, it's refurbished and 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 and. and uh, doesn't sound like very much, you know. Okay, China's got it, but up, you got to think. Up until this point, really, the only major power operating aircraft carriers, which are the sort of signature force projection tool of, of, of modern global strategy, the, the only major one has been the United States, and now China has a significant has a significant uh, uh, aircraft carrier development development program. The second one, the first one, that's to say, the first one that was. Com completely built in China was launched two years ago uh, yeah. at least another one and maybe two are already under already under construction this is th these are these these are flying aircraft with sophisticated stealth uh, capacity uh, with uh, other kinds of warships with uh, ultra modern radars and all I mean this is the whole this is the whole modern naval force power projection power projection force um, the first overseas Chinese military bases have been in uh, Djibouti, the first, the first, the first one in the in the Horn of Africa. Um, again, doesn't necessarily seem so striking. We're very used to thinking about the United States having military bases all around the world, which of course has been the, the global force structure of the United States. But uh, the fact that 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 that, that the United States is re really is no longer the only power, or the United States and the former colonial powers are no longer the only powers with operating overseas military bases that the Chinese are now beginning to do this, um, gaining the experience of of, glo of of real global power projection is very, very, is very, is very, very significant. Um, you know, there's a huge liter literature now, huge literature on the, around the question of can China rise peacefully? Or is the is the rise of China inevitably gonna 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 produce gonna produce war? I think it's the wrong question. Um, history history shows that the the, the the hegemonic global hegemonic powers will fight to defend their hegemony even once the economic basis of it has passed. I believe that will be the case. Uh, I believe we are likely to see um, military confrontation or at least the possibility of mil military confrontation. In the South China Sea and, and and elsewhere, but it's not so much. I mean, it's provoked by the rise of China, if you like. But it's 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 the it's the it's the running out of alternatives from the point of view of the United States, except the use of, except the use of military force. So this is a kind. Of, this I'm just just wrapping up here with a couple of just a couple of final final thoughts. 
Um, this is a kind of interesting chart. This is this is um, this is actually from the Deutsche Bank, a paper they produced entitled "The World Economy: A Millennial Perspective." So you can see you can see the kind of forces that are thinking about these questions. So this is. This is this is this is uh, this is gross domestic percentage of world gross domestic product on the left on the left hand scale here. So this is China. So here's the decline of China. This this down swinging line here. So we begin in 1820 with about 40 percent. I mean, it's still enormously powerful, right? And then this uninterrupted decline. This is the period of the opium wars and everything else I've been talking about. The the the, the, the scramble for China, dismemberment of China, uh, and then. And then the the, the 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 sort of bottoming out during the period of the of, of, of the Chinese of the Chinese Revolution, and then um, the, the the increase here of the rising the rising arc, China of course producing more and more of the the, the world's gross domestic product. Um, so here's Britain. You can see about a quarter of the world's GDP in the in the nineteen in the in the eighteen hundreds. This is the, this is the great century of, of the British Empire, and then kind of declining as. Essentially, as the United States, which is the, the 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 blue line here, light blue line rises. So there's a certain point here. It's it's actually exactly where it is doesn't matter, but 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 it's right around 19 between 1900 1910, where the 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 percentage of world gross domestic product produced in the United States surpasses that produced in Britain. So the former hegemon. The ex, or rather, the existing hegemonic power, Britain, is is passed by the by, by by the United States. Well, of course, the actual, in terms of politics and military power, the actual transition of hegemonic power doesn't doesn't take place for another another thirty or forty years till world, till the end of World War Two, when the United States percentage of global gross domestic product is going to max out here about thirty percent. Um, but this is the arc. This is the period between between the inflection point here, where the where the Chinese become oh, sorry, where the United States becomes the largest world economy. Well, it really depends what measure you what measure of you choose how how you choose to measure gross domestic product. There's a number of different ways you can do it. But 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 there's no question that 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 that, that the, the the tendency of these of these lines. Is the declining percentage of world gross domestic product produced by the United States and the rising percentage produced by China? Those lines are going to cross. I mean, that's the absolute. They may already have crossed, depending on which measure you take. That's a absolutely. That's a absolutely, cast iron prediction, um, and that adjustment, just as this adjustment here. In the early 1900s, leads to leads to a period of. Great global instability, two world wars, a great depression. I mean, these are the products of this. Um, I think you could kind of imagine that what's going to follow this point is going to be similar, in some ways, similar, similar, similar patterns. Um, I think if you think about it in terms of the long, the long patterns of history I've been, I've been describing tonight. I mean, obviously, at, at great speed and not in any great depth. Not in any great depth, but 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 there's a certain sort of swing of the pendulum of of of, of this sort of center of, of of world politics, world economics back towards back towards Asia, back towards back towards China. Um, final point, however, is that is the great the great great wild card in all of this is of course what's going to happen. What are what are what are the workers going to do? Um, we often think about nation states, and in some ways, I've been talking about them tonight as sort of homogenous entities which have common interests, and which we all know is really not is really not true. These states are a divide, a class divided. People have different different interests. Um, what's happening in China, in many ways, uh, all proportions guarded, looks like the kind of pace of industrial development in the early in the early industrial revolution in Britain or something like that the massive movement of people from the from the countryside into the into the in, 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 into the into the cities um, and and really the creation of a new of a new working class mm. um, and a working class that's going to find it's that's organized in massive workplaces I mean we're talking about factories of 40 50 60 thousand people I mean gigantic the sort of workplaces that that you had in the night in the United States in the 1930s 40s 50s um, and all of the potential 
political power, political strength, political activity that can that can emerge from it. And it already is doing. I mean, it's it's there's not a lot of you have to dig for this in, in the United States, but the 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 there are already increasing signs of political activism from the from, from, from the working class in China. So I believe you have to, you ha in addition to looking at these bigger sort of state level, ec economy level questions that I've been raising with you all tonight, you, you, it's also, I think, important to think about how that, how this, how this shapes up in sort of terms of, of, of social divisions, class, class divisions, um, and, 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 and possible, and, and possible uh, outcomes um, going in, well, potentially, I think, very optimistic directions, but maybe we can come back to that in the discussion. So I'm going to leave it there. I've covered an awful, really an awful lot of ground. Um, I hope giving you something to think about and, uh, and, and let's talk, let's hopefully, um, let's talk about it for a bit. Well, thank you so much, Professor Buchanan. Um, I had uh, one question which arose because I watched uh, your lecture today as well. Um, uh -huh. When you're speaking about China, though, in 1500, it, obviously it did not develop any kind of a free uh, capitalism. Right. And, and is that because of the stability, in a way, of the centralized state versus in Western Europe where capitalism did develop out of a kind of a chaos and the lack of a centralized authority? I, 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 my opinion is yes. That's that's a very substantial factor in the in the equation. I mean, there are obviously historians who have have different answers to that. I mean, there's a whole. I don't know if I've got the book here someplace. Okay, this uh, this is a very important book for people if you want to for, for studying this stuff this is Kenneth Pomeranz's book the great the great divergence uh, um, which which discusses some of these questions he has a very he ha, he, he he looks he, he comes to some rather different conclusions than I than I have done here um, he, um, he he he, uh, he he's uh, he talks about um, he talks about the uh, problems of decentralized resources in China he talks about the the location of coal and iron ore and the difficulties of bringing them together and stuff like that um, in comparison to Britain where they're relatively it's a small area they're relatively they're relatively centralized and stuff so 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 I, I think that's an interesting argument I don't think it's totally I don't think it's totally untrue um, but I don't think it's I, I personally don't think it's the I think that I think these social and political questions of the attitude of the of the Chinese state to to mercantile activity is, in my opinion, is 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 is, is much more weighty, um, and certainly I think that that make as you were pointing out there, Sandy, I think that makes the contrast with Western Europe of the de of the of the consequences of political decentralization in Western yeah. Europe. Um, it, it, it kind of uh, makes that very very clear. I I I, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. That the ability of merchants to operate um, in, in in Europe is on is just on a is, is on a is on a far higher level than it is than it is in China. I mean, it's it's not that the Ming don't want merchants; they do want. I mean, Confucian 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 ideology rec recognizes the importance of merchants. You need people to move stuff around, and you know, you, they, they, they they play an important social play an important social function. But it's but 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 they're dangerous. They're dangerous. Because their because their desire for personal acquisition um, always has this potential to spill over into into sort of political into political opposition and destabilizing etc etc etc. So you want to keep them. You don't want to encourage them. You don't want to validate what they're doing ideology ideologically. You don't want to give them too much leeway. You you particularly want to control foreign their their relationship with 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 with, with foreign trade. Uh, I, I think whereas in whereas you know whereas in Western Europe, I mean, if particularly if you look at England from the certainly from the from, from, from the uh, you know from, from the period after the after the English Civil War in the 1660s, 16 on, on, onwards, the, the English state is I mean the function of the I mean one of the main functions of the English state is to promote commerce and, and trade overseas. Right. Um, is to build a navy and all that, you know that's capable of protecting and acquiring new territories and colonial outposts. And so the relationship between the state and, and the economy in 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 Western Europe is is completely completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Once 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 this you know once this once this process once this process begins. So 
Um, I, 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 to me, that's the heart of the matter. But you know, you pay your money and you take your choice on the global history questions. There's a lot. There's a lot of variables in play and thinking about how it all, how it all works, how it all works together. Is you know, is a, is, is obviously a, is, 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 is a major challenge. Uh -huh. And are there other questions or comments? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that's been a that was, it's been a fascinating. Uh, um, lecture so far. I, I, I have a question about um, how you view the, I guess, the cultural hegemony that, that sort of the, the Anglophone world has, has really sort of dominated in so many different ways culturally. Uh, and, and the influence of that, um, I would say linguistic and cultural hegemony. Um, I grew up in India, right? And, and that was, was a a huge part of my upbringing was was sort of this, the uh, the, the constant bombardment of of Western uh, culture and language, and that is a place where I feel like China is lagging compared to its military strength, its economic strength. Um, and I'm curious to think, curious to sort of think about how that might influence um, the, the the continued rise of China. Yeah, that's a really that 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 that's a really great question, and I, I and I mean clearly, um, you know, what we might refer to as soft power as as, as sort of cultural because cultural power, cultural influence, um, is it it is very central to the to to the to, to the organization to, to the organization of of U.S. global global hegemony. Absolutely, you're you're absolutely right to to to, to raise that. Um, I mean, what's interesting is it has a sort of life of its. It has a sort of life of its own, to some degree. I mean, it's, which means that 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 in some ways now the cult, the cultural, the linguistic, the you know predominance. It, 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 it sort of reminds me of that old Roadrunner cartoon, you know, where he has little his little legs of the Roadrunner are spinning round and 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 he's run off the edge of the cliff, but the legs are still spinning. Um, it's there's an aspect of that 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 that, that cultural hegemony that those cultural influences are sort are, are sort of still they're still very powerful, but the the underpin the, the economic underpinnings have, have 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 begun to have begun to erode. I mean, I'm not making some you know huge prediction that there's going to be a massive you know that we're on the verge of a massive shift or some or or, or, or some or something like or something like that. But you know, I I. I mean, it's interesting that you raise India because I mean, I think if you, I think if you were, if you, if you were, I, I'm going to stick my neck out here now. I, I think if you grew up in the, in India today, rather than a few years ago when you when you when you were when you were growing up there, I'm not going to. It would, yeah, you're still going to be exposed to a great deal of of, of of American Western culture, but you. It doesn't mean to say these are all progressive influences, right? Um, politically or or, or 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 whatever. But uh, but 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 I think you would find that there's that 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 the, 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 the challenge to that is is probably greater now than it than than even than even a few than even a few years ago. Um, that you know the sense that the United see the the the, the hegemony question that the question of hegemony is. It, it, it rests on economic and military power, but there's also there's mm -hmm. hegemonic leadership implies cultural. Right. I, I mean, there's a sort of moral element to it, right? That the the, the 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 hegemon is the is the source of justice, is the source of is the is the source of is the is the source of sort of moral authority in the world, which the United States lays claim to in 19. I mean, you can say, however, unjustly in reality, but but lays claim to it, and it, and it sort of works. You know, I'm very interested by this because I think there's another side of this COVID thing, which is, mm -hmm. w w w w w which is, you know, the the moral authority of the United States in the COVID crisis is like sub zero on a global on a global scale, right? The moral authority of China has been enhanced by this. It se it, se it seems to me. Um, you know, and I, again, I'm not making some huge prediction that everything's changed and stuff, but you know, that's significant. I think other things that have great that have great cultural weight. I mean, if you think like things like space programs, right? Um, 
you know, the, if you think about the, the sort of high points of the United States hegemony in the in the in the 60s, the, 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 the tremendous sense of national accomplishment that was built up around the around around this. Well, who's doing that now? Um, you know, the U.S. A, a good chunk, as you all know, a good chunk of the the, the sort of uh, you know U.S. space program has been subcontracted to Elon Musk and other private private entrepreneurs for their own whatever. In contrast, right? In contrast to what China again, I I I, I don't want to exaggerate any of this, but but I think that um, you know, I think that the I, I think that that cultural hegemony is real. I think it was an absolutely absolutely critical part of Amer of, the, of the establishment of American power after World War II. But I'm not sure that its longevity is quite what it might have seemed even a even a few even a few years ago. It's not about to it's not about to disappear. But I think it's I think it's claim to I think its claim to moral justice and rightness is looking a little weak, or weaker, shall we say? I don't know. Does that answer? Does that answer, answer your question? It's a great question. Kurt, Kurt, did you have your? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, thanks, Professor Buchanan, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, my uh, comment was uh, kind of in relation to what the prior uh, person just uh, brought up, uh -huh. and that there's a competing theory regarding soft power and the use of soft cultural power in that China has actually benefited from not bombarding many countries with their views, their personal and cultural views as well, well as language and pop culture. And in, I know in many cases in, in countries in Africa, they have actually been very, um, receptive to the Chinese position because that cultural baggage, you know, if and I'm using a pejorative term to describe it, but the cultural baggage that the United States may have had or the, the prior European colonizers had, China usually doesn't go in with that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're there to build a highway and be paid for it without necessarily, you know, uh, changing the language or changing the religion of the uh, native populations in the countries, and uh, and in many cases they're doing quite well. Yeah. With that I, again, I, 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 yeah, no, I think that's, I, I, again, I think that's that that that's 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 absolutely that's absolutely true. Although, as a sort of um, rider to that, maybe corollary to that, whatever, I would say that that the that 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 that. that, that that the ability of China to present itself as the, as the, even as the, the non-colonial or even as the anti-colonial power in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, right? In a sense, that's its own form of soft power. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. So, yeah. you yeah. know, um, and of course, at the end of World War II, the US, that was the, in sub-Saharan Africa, that was the, that was the US calling card in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. However, in the course of the 1950s, it became painfully obvious that, that in fact, the United States, when it really, you know, on most critical questions, it's going to back the form of the form of European imperial powers in Africa. Sure. So, 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 you know, the arrival of China, of China, now Chinese investment, I'm thinking about the massive railroad construction in, 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 in uh, the East, A East African railroad project in, uh, in, in, in Tanzania and, um, uh, and uh, and you and Uganda, um, you know these are so. Yeah, that's that that in and of itself becomes a different form of sort of, of, of yeah. projection of of of, of 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 power and 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 of, and of influence. So I'm not I'm not disputing what you what uh, at all your 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 main your main point. I'm I, I'm I'm but I guess I'm sort of saying that the, the ways in which soft power can be deployed. You know, we we tend to think because of because of our own experience of the U.S. experience that it's about you know it's the I mean one historian describes it the cocoa colonization of the world right mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of seen in those terms but there there are other there are other potential m modalities which are actually could could be quite effective in this particular historical conjuncture it's, it, 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 it it seems it seems to me um, I think I'm I'm sorry Robin Robin. You're muted. Yeah. Well, in reaction to this, um, I have two two questions, sort of. One is a reaction to what you're just talking about, and this is maybe a a bigoted uh, 
and lack of knowledge, but it seems to me that Confucianism doesn't have the kind of strength to compete in the um, digital age culturally with pop culture. I mean, that, and <laughs> that's, Okay, that's, but my real question was uh, related to why did uh, the neoliberals of the last couple of decades outsource, uh, you know, manufacturing to China? Okay, we didn't want to pay decent salaries here and we could get all the things produced in China cheaper and then they would be brought back but didn't was it, wasn't that a way of totally undermining our strength Trump, actually? Yeah. And, and I mean, and that's what Trump is saying now. Why did he do that? Right. Yeah, but, well, that's a great question. I mean, you, you know, I think that the, 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 the Capitalism is not assessed. Capitalism and capitalists are not are not really given to long range planning. Okay, so. This is that they, they make decisions on on a, on a very short term basis by and by 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 and large, um, and 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 on and on 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 the basis of of of, of profit. I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying, obviously, but I, I don't think by much. So from that point of view, think about what they do. 1945, 1946, 1947, they rebuilt the Marshall Plan. They rebuild the entire German Western European economy, which was completely flattened, right, at the end of World War. They, they rebuild, it's not the Marshall Plan, but it's the parallel to it. They rebuild the Japanese economy. Right. From the from the ground from the ground from the ground up, it makes it makes complete and utter hundred percent sense for them to do that. They need markets for American products. The war's over. They still produce, you know. They need to reconvert to to, to consumer goods. They need markets. They need they need they need markets. For, they need markets for all of that, and they create them at the cost of billions of dollars, but they create them. It's very effective. It's one of the things that powers the great post-war expansion of American, of American capitalism. But there's a price to pay down the road, which is until the 1960s, even until the early 70s, as, as, as some of you, because we lived through this, you didn't find a Japanese car on the roads of America. Not a single, I mean, not, not like not many, I mean, none. What had happened was that, was, that, was that the United States rebuilds the Japanese economy correctly for its own reasons and its own in, in short term interests. But of course, it, Japan then creates, is then able to create a much a, a more productive manufacturing model, which 15 or 20 years later, is then able to start to undercut the United States itself. I mean, so, so you know, a lot of these sort of right-wing ideologues will be like, well, it was a terrible mistake. We should never have rebuilt this. We should never have rebuilt Germany and Japan. But it was, they, they, from their point of view, they were, it was completely right to do so. But there was a price to pay for that down the road. There was a price to pay for all of that. It's the same with the it's the same with the the, 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 the offshoring of, of manufacturing. You have a period of tremendous expansion in the U.S. in the in the fifties in the fifties and sixties. It's real. I mean, you you know, some of us lived through this. You remember this year on year, right? It's just a sort of you know that next year's okay. There's a there's there's a business cycle. There's some ups, but the, in general, the general trajectory was 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 rising. That runs out of that. That runs, and it's partly fueled by their by their world that by their world sta status. By the by the by the seventies, by the late sixties and early seventies, that's running out of steam. The relative competitiveness of U.S. business is declining. It's connected to the loss of the war in Vietnam, but that's a whole other that's a whole other question. So they start to they they start to f try and find other avenues to 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 increase their. 
their profitability. It's it's very it's very straightforward. Start in Mexico, the Mexico starts getting a little bit too expensive. You move on to some. You, I mean, you chase this around the world: China, Bangladesh, India, Vietnam. I mean, you know the story, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that it's wrong from them from their immediate point of view. Mm -hmm. But then we have the rust area of the whole middle middle west of our country, so called. Absolutely, I don't. I, of course, and an enormous and an enormous social consequence that the, the, the absolute devastation of vast sections of the United States and so on and so forth, and a sharp, a wider class division in the United right. in, in the in the United States. Yes. Those are, I'm not. I'm not saying it's morally right or, or politically right. I, I'm saying from the point of view of the people making the money, it was. It made economic sense for them to do that. But there's a price. To, but but it was a price to pay down down the road. Now I do think China, because because of the, the structure of the sort of state managed capitalism, state directed capitalism, there is a little bit. There is, and again, I'm not. I'm not justifying this morally. I'm not. It's not my point at all, but but I think there is a greater capacity for for planning, for organisation, for mobilisation of resources, etc., 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 which 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 gives them a tremendous advantage at certain at, at certain levels in in, in this. Um, right. You know, the problem is the only way you bring manufacturing back to the United States under capitalism. I mean, I'm talking about under capitalism. Is to, is to drive the wage levels of the United States workers down to something approximating to those in China or, 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 or India. Yeah. And make it profitable to produce here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you all know the consequence, you, you know, to, you start posing it like that, then you start seeing this China, this sort of global pattern I've been talking about in a little bit of a different, in a little bit of a different light as well, I think so. And, and it's why this question of how people, it's not just these unified ho homogeneous states, but how the different social classes within those states re start reacting to that starts to become a major, starts to become a major factor. I mean, look, the two party system, which has been the main prop of political structuring of, 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 of American of American society, cap capitalist society is, is, is coming apart before your very eyes. Yeah. Um, and it's not gonna be put back together. Right, and it's coming apart under pressure. I mean, and it's not that pe these are all people don't think it in class terms, but 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 it's manifesting those. It's manifesting those. The consequences of the Rust Belt and the massive unemployment yeah. and all and, and 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 all the rest of it. And you know, these to go back to the point about the the soft power. These become these become start becoming major sort of soft power questions, right? Of the perception of. What these states look like, how they behave, how, what 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 moral authority they claim—all of those kind of all, all of those kind of questions. It's, I mean, you know, it's it's a super interesting period. It's a super interest. This is a turning point of history period we're entering into here. Yeah. I mean, that would be the conclusion of the whole lecture, right? Yeah. In a certain in a cer in a certain way, um, in which things that have been not on the agenda or not been thought about as as as, as part of our world suddenly become part of it in ways that are, you know, un un unanticipated and... Anyway, that's I, think, I, did. <laughs> I think Kurt, maybe uh, maybe we should wind up also as it's getting kind of late, but Kurt Maida, by the way, uh, Professor Buchanan, this is Kurt Maida, who is an attorney uh, colleague of mine. Hi. Uh, Hi. Maybe I can just say, this is Robin Lloyd, the Murads, I don't, I didn't get your other name, but anyway, these are all part of Vicky and- um, Okay, don't, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna go get my dinner in a while, but don't, I'm not in any hurry to rush off. So if you guys wanna carry on talking, I'm happy to carry on talking. It's only like, you know, the most important thing we can talk about, but anyway. Okay, well, <laughs> so, Kurt, you know. Kurt. Yeah, so a quick uh, question slash comment uh, in response to even what Robin was saying. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of politicians I feel right now are talking about exactly what the professor said. You know, why did we bend over backwards for China? Why did we do this? And I'm wondering, you know, in addition to the economic soft, uh, the economic, whether it's soft power or the short sightedness of, you know, the capitalist powers, you know, uh, that we are referring to. Uh, you know, you showed a slide of uh, Richard Nixon, President Nixon, meeting with Mao Zedong. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think it's important also to remember that there was also a political, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, part of this issue also in that, you know, we were trying to encourage the Sino-Soviets split. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Uh, so there was a, you know, a political component to this uh, discussion and, and this bending over backwards and giving China a most favored nation status in, in, in the context of trade. So, I mean, how much, you know, is that, you know, it, you know, how much of a role did that play in the growth of China, uh, economically speaking? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's, again, that's a great point. And I think there's a, you know, these, these kind of decisions are, they, they're, they're often, they are often multi-layered, right? That there's an immediate political, there's a political purpose, right? And not only to deepen the Sino-Soviet split, which was definitely a piece of it, but, but in particular to try and engineer, to try and engineer an exit from here, from losing, from the, from the war they were just losing in Vietnam, right? Mm-hmm. So there was, there was some definitely conjunctural political, you know, because it's you know, it's 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 really how history works in a way. Is the question behind this, which is a, which is a big 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 question, right? Which is not that there's some like you know cabal of capitalists who says, "God oh, boy, we really need to get into chart. We need to you know, let's we really need to exploit some cheap." There are plenty of cabals of capitalists, by the way, but that's not how the decisions. That's not how these big decisions get. You know, we really need to get into China and start super exploiting the Chinese workers, and you know that's going to sell a bunch of workers in the American Midwest down the river. And how are we going to deal? You know, they 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 just they act in what they perceive as their interests, right? So when the dip when the political and diplomatic openings come, there's 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 other people, there's other forces, and they they are represented politically, they are represented diplomatically. You know, let's try while we're there, let's see if we can do a trade deal. You know, let's see if we can. You know, while we're while we're while while we're while we're talking while we're you know prodding Mao into deepening the Sino-Soviet split, or while we're trying to find a way out of the war in Vietnam, let's also try and do this other thing we need to do, which is let's see if we could, and then let's see if we can start producing there. You know, really, that, there's a tremendous. See, you've got to remember that, that the idea of China. I mean, this really. This really goes back to the United States in the 18, and even in the 1890s when they have a te- when they have an economic downturn in the 1890s. That they're already, to- I mean, economists, politicians, business figures in the U.S. are already thinking about China. I mean, they even have a thing. They even have a sort of ideological, which is completely bonkers, but it was a very popular idea at the time, which is that the sort of the sort of center of civilization is always moving. It's always sort of moving westward, right? So it's sort of from Europe. It jumps across to the Americas. It crosses the continent, and now it's going to, you know, now it's going to head out across the Pacific, and then the new, the new frontier is going. I mean, you read, you read Theodore Roosevelt. He's always talk, this is how he describes it. Right. So, right. The, so, so the place of China. I mean, the, 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 the multi-million market of China is always there in their minds, uh, particularly in some of the, you know, export-oriented business sectors and stuff. So, so I don't know. I, I'm not really answering your question. I'm just saying that these are these these phenomena happen on, you know, they're they're, they're multi-layer phenomena, right? They're, they're, yes, there's a political justif- there's an immediate political and ju- and diplomatic maneuverings. I mean, I study it in World War Two. There's there's a yeah they don't dis, there's mili- how does military decision making factor into these broader economic and you know those are complicated questions. But that, but there is that multi layered thing as they move forward as they re engage with China. Yeah, it opens the way to some other, and once that thing starts to get rolling, it doesn't need very much, right? It needs a few businesses to say, hey, this is going to work great. These guys are going to cut us some great deals. But they're going to the Chinese government is going to basically provide us with cheap labor. They're going to suspend all their labor laws in these special districts. That they're not going to tax us. Well, you know what's not to like. So then, so then their rivals want to get in on the deal as well. So you don't want to be, you know. So the thing starts, and it's very quick. By the late, by the by the late seventies, early eighties, the you know these special economic zones, the, the the whole thing's off to the races in China. And there's no question. And of course. They are learning how to do this stuff. They're observing, they're studying, they're, they're, they're going to try and develop, you know, they, not, they have no intention of being, a, of being an export producing platform indefinitely. You've got to develop a Chinese, cons- Chinese consumer market. Yeah. Niall, is that right? Yeah. Niall. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's great. Thank you. I uh, know, and, and you made this point towards the end of your lecture, and I think it's a really critical one that uh, China is not immune to the internal political forces uh, that, you know, in, in some ways there are some parallels to, to what the U.S. is experiencing or what Europe experienced. And, and, and the tendency, the shift towards the strongmanship that we're seeing in China now is actually fairly exceptional in the, in the span of the last several decades. Uh, with with President Xi and 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 there you do see this tendency or the shift towards self interest, governmental self interest, uh, short term thinking, um, and and that that I think could be could be detrimental to to sort of the the long term planning that had had put China on this uh, tremendous path uh, from the from the seventies eighties onward. Uh, so, so that that's also a shift, and I think the I think young people, the 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 influential political class in China now, are increasingly connected to the West in ways that they 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 manifest and express their influence often uh, in a way that 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 models um, the ways of 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 of. Western aristocracy, or and, and and that's a really interesting trend to see as well, because that's brand new in China. Uh, so so that's at some point going to come to a head as well, and it's really interesting to see how that compares to what is 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 happening, perhaps happening, uh, you know, thirty forty years ahead of where China is right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, these. All of this, all of this stuff becomes more difficult for China to navigate. There's no question. I mean, the, the, the stakes get higher, the options get tighter in certain in in in, in certain ways, um, and the consequences of promoting a Chinese. I mean, you say middle class, but you know, Chinese domestic cons consumption and so on. Yeah, the, the, you know, um, become bec be 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 become more chancy more 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 risky but and 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 within that framework you know the, the possibilities i mean this is a we don't we, we haven't really seen this i mean the possibilities of massive labor struggles in a country that's still nominally communist right yeah. in which it's official yeah. ideology you know i mean that's where does that go what form does what forms does that what what political forms does that start to start to take i think that's very that's very interesting question what sort of engagement with the history of stalin and stalinism and it's and and, and the imposition of those sort of models you know a reckoning with the cultural revolution or a reckoning with the great leap forward those kind of things that's that's I would the only thing I would set on the other side of the scales and is, is I think there's been a sort of facile thing in the way I'm not accusing you of being facile but there's been a sort of facile thing in the West that somehow that cap the, 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 the relationship between sort of liberal freedom of you know freedom of speech and freedom of free, free exchange of ideas and all this stuff is sort of critical to to innovation and stuff I don't I mean that doesn't seem to be I, I that, that doesn't seem plausible to me at all that it, that's the, the, the what's necessary for innovation on these sort of levels is basically huge huge amounts of state funding and big research projects and 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 and, and, and stuff right and 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 the idea that capitalism would necessarily breed liberal li, liberal politics in china i think is 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 is, is not true yeah. um and and seems and seems not to be seems not to be the case and of course there's this is also matched by the increasing illiberalism in, in, in American society. Mm -hmm. that, that, that the restrictions on, demo, on, on, on democratic rights and free speech and all the rest of it, some of it done in the name of prosecuting Trump and stuff, right? Yeah. Um, you know, becomes very, very, in my opinion, becomes very, very, becomes very, very dangerous. And, 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 and also the, 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 sort of, the sort of model of the US as the, as the sort of moral leader of, 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 of democracy and freedom and liberty becomes increasingly, become, you know, becomes increasingly tarnished, basically. Um, which, which, is, which is kind of interesting because it means the, op the opportunity for other, for other political ideas, for other for other perspectives to, to to get to get some to get traction in this kind of situation, I don't think it's necessarily going to be the case that 
when, as Chinese youth become more rebellious against their situation in China, they're going to na their natural the natural turn will be towards embracing the values of the United States. I don't think that's there's no reason. To, it seems to me no reason to suppose that that's true at all. Um, just as it's not true in India, as we were talking about as we were talking about earlier, and it may not look pretty in the short term. Um, but the openness, the, there's, there's the, the, the sort of openness to, 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 to engagement with different sets of ideas is, I think, going to be very, very interesting. So, anyway. Are there any last questions? I think we all maybe are all going to have some dinner, but Robin, and that maybe should be our last. Go ahead, Robin. Well, um, Dr. Buchanan, this has been so fascinating, and especially with all the maps and so on. I love that. Uh, Sandy has told me about your course, and uh, I'm over 65, and I understand maybe would I be able to get into it even at this late date to just zoom in if you... Um, I, let's talk about that. I don't know. It's not so easy at this point, but it comes uh, around. Don't worry. It'll come around. Oh, yeah. It'll, it'll, but it'll, he, it'll, also, he also teaches a fabulous class on the 20th century on both World War One and World War Two. In fact, it, I, I have, do have one last comment. Plug for my book here, Global History of World but, War II. But I there asked you, you how to get it. I asked you in an email how I can get it, and you didn't respond. How did uh, you get it? Amazon? I hate to say, but go on and go and line Jeff Bezos' pockets. Get it from Amazon. <laughs> All right. Okay. But let me let me just say that one of the things that he brought that Professor Buchanan brought to my mind was that Americans in general think of World War II in particular as a war in Europe, right? As a great confrontation between Britain, the Americans, and the Germans. But there was a whole different war going on in, in Asia and the Pacific that I never gave much thought to. And if you do think about it, the main war for the United States point of view was the war over China, wasn't it? I mean, we oh, equal, equally important. Yeah. Right. And, and I had I don't think most Americans think about that. At all. Right. Anyway. I, I, I agree. And plus, I don't think it ends in 1945. Exactly. I mean, I think, for exactly. example, that you'd have to see Indian independence right. as a direct as a direct right. as a constituent part of the outcome of World War Two. And also the victory of Mao Zedong, I suppose. Oh, absolutely! Ch uh, Chinese Revolution, right. the the developments of in I mean, the Indone Indonesia, Victoria. Vietnam, yeah, the whole thing. Absol I know. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, our view of World War Two is this thing that comes to a screeching halt in 1945. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's an right. absolute barrier to understanding what the whole thing was really about. Exactly. And 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 how and what the outcome really and what the outcomes I shouldn't say outcome the outcomes really re, 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 really really were I mean you know the form let's I mean just the form that Indian independence takes is 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 at least in part and it is at least in part deflecting some of the absolutely the depth of the popular radicalism that came out of the that came out of the war right. which wasn't was not just about an independent you know let's create a nice independent capitalist India but was but had but had really profound tr social transformative ele elements to it and it, it comes right out of, it comes right out of the war there's no question um, and 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 likewise in Indonesia in Vietnam in China obviously and Korea um, too right and Co Korea yeah this sounds yeah. like another this sounds like another great topic for us to take on <laughs> anytime what happened hey, great. in World War II today Great. Well, yeah. thank you, Beth, and thank you for hosting this, and hope to, well, I'll see you again, Professor Buchanan. You will. Yeah. All right. And good great. to meet you on great questions. Thanks for, thank, thanks for thank your you. great yeah. questions. Thanks really, so really appreciate thank it. Yeah. Thank you very much. As, as you see, there's nothing I like better than talking about this stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity with a, with, a great, with a great audience. So thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, take yeah. care. It's very fascinating. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Okay. So we'll maybe we'll continue the discussion at some point. That will be fun. Yes. So anyway, Great. take Thank take you. take take care, folks. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna go and have my dinner now. So yeah. <laughs>